As I mentioned earlier today, the reason this segment is in this course is because as we look at this accident history, what we find is that in 68% of these accidents, automation dependency plays a significant part in leading these crews to either a critical flight attitude or the requirement to extract max performance from their planes. Automation dependent pilots allowed their airplanes to get much closer to the edge of the envelope than they should have. As we start to study this issue, we decide to take a new tact on this. And so what you're going to hear a lot more at American Airlines is a discussion of what we're going to call levels of automation and technology judgment. What are levels of automation? Well, you know, the doctor, doctor guys are going to tell you that there's like seven levels of automation or something in our airplanes. It gives me a headache. I'm kind of a simple guy. I'm going to suggest to you that there's basically three levels of automation in our planes. The lowest level of automation, you might call manual, is when you're hand flying the airplane, the throttles and the controls, and by the inputs and cues that you're getting from your instrumentation and your outside visual cues, you are determining the vertical and lateral path of this plane by flying it. The next highest level of automation would be when you have an autopilot engaged and you're using the flight guidance system in your airplane to tell that autopilot what to do with the plane's flight path for short periods of time. You know, like flight level change, vertical speed, altitude hold, heading select, that stuff. And then the highest level of automation is when we have an autopilot engaged and we're using a flight management computer to tell that autopilot what to do with the flight path of this plane for hours and hours. Low, medium, high. Now the question becomes, which is the appropriate level for the task at hand? You know, you could say all this automation was put in our two-man airplanes to reduce the workload on the two-man crew. That's why it's in there. And you could say that to go up a level of automation will reduce workload, and that would be true in many scenarios. You know, FMC hooked up to a autopilot's a great workload reducer for crossing the North Atlantic. You can also say, however, that going down a level in automation will reduce workload in certain scenarios. And as we study the accident history, what we find in the vast majority of the cases is this, that the crew, the two-man crew, has lost situation awareness. Well, how'd that happen? Well, the two-man crew became task-saturated. Well, how'd they become task-saturated? In the vast majority of the accidents, they became task saturated because they were trying to operate at too high a level of automation and a rapidly changing flight path requirement. Did you hear what I just said? They needed to drop down a level in order to maintain their situation awareness. They had to reduce workload. As an example, as an example, Suppose uh, you're coming in on a star somewhere. Let's say in an FMC airplane to start with. We'll deal with flight guidance too in a minute. It, we're coming in an FMC airplane uh, on a star someplace. And we've probably had that star arrival all loaded up in that computer for an hour or more. And everything's going just as planned. And we're in LNAV and VNAV and everything's going just great. And we're stroking down the star. And as long as everything goes as planned, it all works perfect. But let's say as you're coming through around 20,000 feet or so, the controller calls you up and says, American umpty ump, change your arrival. I want you to turn left now, head so-and-so, descend to maintain such-and-such -such an altitude, intercept the so-and-so uh, radial of the such-and-such -such VOR for the arrival to umpty ump runway. At this point, is it time to go? Or is it time to drop down a level? It's time to drop down a level, isn't it? I mean, what did he just say? He said, head so-and-so, heading select, so-and-so. Descend to such-and-such -such an altitude, set it, flight level change. Now the plane's going where he asked us to go, in our heads up, and we know it is. 
And then he said, intercept so-and-so radio. Well, tune it in, identify it, present it, because you have to. That's given work. American Airlines says we must have that raw data presented to do this stuff. That's a given amount of work. It must be done. Now, if you have time later to go type it all in and get it full up and you wish to and then hook up, fine. But it shouldn't be your initial move. Because what happens if you make that initial move? Well, two things happen. First off, the airplane's not going where you want it to go yet. Second, if one guy's typing and changing flight path, the other guy must check it, or gal. Let there be no doubt. We do not change the flight paths in these FMCs without both pilot agreeing that the new flight path is correct. The reason that is, is because these FMCs are not error resistant. They're not even close. By that I mean you can type into these FMCs something that is clearly wrong, and the FMC will do it. Likewise, you can type into these FMCs something that is absolutely correct, but because of a database anomaly that you have no way of knowing about, it comes up with the wrong answer. You've got to check that work. It takes two people. That takes time. That task saturates the crew. Drop down a level. Reduce your workload. Keep your SA up. Another great example it applies to you uh, flight guidance airplanes just as well as the FMC kind of people. And I, I bet every pilot in this room has seen this. I bet you have all seen this act. Watch. I'm out there doing one of my once a month turnarounds, you know, that I get to do. And, uh, and, and so I'm out there doing uh, one of those. I think it was a veil turnaround. In fact, Doug was on my jump seat watching, and, uh, and uh, we'd gone out the veil, and we're coming back, and we're doing one of those arrivals, you know, the... Uh, uh, coming in from the northwest at Dallas. They used to call it the Boyd's arrival. Now it's called the Bowie arrival. And, uh, and it's a perfect day. I mean, it's beautiful. It's clear. The only kind of day I fly on. And, uh, <laughs> and so we're, we're, roaring, we're roaring down the Bowie arrival, which I have had programmed up in my FMC since Colorado Springs. You know what I mean? And everything's going perfect. LNAV, VNAV, perfect. And I'm coming down the Bowie arrival. Everything's synced up just great. I can see the airport up there out in the distance. I got everything in sight. I'm coming through 10,000 feet. I'm all programmed up for a one-way 1-8 one right arrival, aren't I? Right? And as I steam down this thing, all programmed up for a 1 8 right arrival, I come through about 10,000 and start down for 9,000. Everything's still hooked up perfect. All of a sudden, the controller says, I knew you'd seen that before. The controller says, Change your runway to 1 3 right. Well, I'm about 26 miles out. There's the airport. I can see that piece of pavement, and I extend that piece of pavement, I can see that line's right on my nose, i.e. I'm coming up on the final approach course, even though I'm 25 miles out, the final approach course now is right in front of me, isn't it? And so I look out there and see that, so watch this. From the highest level, LNAV, VNAV, boom, click, 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 straight to the lowest. Remember that stuff? I got it. There's the pavement. You know, you kind of turn yourself around. You sort of line up with that pavement, you know? <laughs> Remember that? There you go, all lined up with the pavement. Now, now listen, I, believe me, I am not faulting my co-pilot. I am not. We created him, okay? My co-pilot goes, I'm flying, you know, I'm turning around here. I'm saying, hey, would you put in the ILS for one three right? I could use the glide slope. You know, 1091, would you? you know, there's airplanes going over my head for one eight right. There's a guy right in front of me. I've got his, I don't have spacing on him now. I got stuff to worry about, don't I? Heads up stuff. It's probably not a good time to be typing. You know, I mean, let me ask you this. In that scenario, you know, there's the airport. Here's me, perfectly clear. What can the computer possibly bring to me that I don't already have? But you see, we have become what I call children of the magenta. <laughs> you know, we think we have to have those magenta lines on the map and that magenta V-bar that's steering us toward that line, or for some reason the plane won't fly. Now I'm being facetious. You know, I, I know you know that. But Sometimes that's probably not the right action. Another, you might, you might be interested in knowing that along that line and that kind of issue, we had a Fokker aircraft a couple, three months ago coming in for 17, 
uh, either center or left, and they gave him a sidestep to 1-7 right. Now he's visual. He's 10 or 12 miles out. He can see the airport straight in. All he's got to do is sidestep, and they go down. And the other pilot watches him, and they land on approach control frequency with no clearance. You've got to pick the appropriate level of automation for the task at hand. To that end, we've determined that we have to change the culture that drives us to attempt to operate at the highest levels at all times. We created this culture. I mean, the whole industry created this culture. And it needs to be changed. And to that end, we have a new course called Human Factors and Safety Training. And it's going to focus on exactly that. You'll be getting that in recurrent training. And everyone seems to be pretty happy with it. It's going to focus on levels of automation and technology judgment. Read that top bullet to yourselves, if you would, and tell me if, if, if you know what I'm trying to say with that. Yeah. I had a guy up in New York last month. He says, oh, you mean be the ball. <laughs> that is what I mean. I'm going to change the slide. That's what I mean, be the ball. You know, I mean, have you flown with this guy now? And if this is you I'm talking about, do not be defensive. In the industry, we created you like this. But have you flown with this guy? You take off in your airplane, and uh, I don't care if it's clear or weather, let's make it a clear day. And you take off, and you lift off, you gear up, you know, you go through first seven climb, second seven climb, you clean up, you set climb power, and everything's going pretty good. You're coming through about six, seven hundred feet, and my co-pilot says, um, hey, can I have the center autopilot in command? Eh, that's fine, I have no problem with that. Put the center autopilot on. Now that the center autopilot's engaged, though, watch his body English. Watch his body English. Oh, the autopilot's on now. Hand leaves the controls. Hands leave the throttles. Feet fall to the floor. Hands fall to the lap. He's at peace with himself. <laughs> you see, the autopilot's got it now. We cannot afford it. Now, you guys and gals know I don't mean 35,000 feet. But when we're down there in the pattern, we're maneuvering, we're changing configurations. We've got power settings going back and forth. The pilot flying, even though the autopilot is on, has got to remain tactilely connected to this plane and mentally flying it, doesn't he? So he will quickly recognize any deviation from acceptable performance parameters or intended flight path. I mean, look at Bucharest. As you may remember, an A310 aircraft, which is a conventionally flown aircraft and behaves much like an A300, Boeing 757 or 767, experienced an auto throttle malfunction on departure from the Bucharest airport. Due to weather conditions at the time, there was no visible horizon. When climb power was selected, investigators believed the right throttle mechanically jammed. Since the auto throttle system senses total thrust required for climb power, the left throttle was slowly retarded to idle. As a result, the aircraft's 18 degree nose high attitude diminished to zero degrees. The aircraft continued to bank further to the left. Passing through about 40 degrees as the thrust differential increased, the aircraft continued rolling until it was nearly inverted. Look at Bucharest. If the co-pilot had just had his hands on the throttles, 128 people would still be alive today. That alone. The autopilot and auto throttles have limitations that affect performance. I think after today's discussion, there's no doubt in anyone's mind about that. And this bullet, boy, this is now coming to the fore more and more often. We see automation-dependent crews lacking confidence in their own ability to fly an airplane are turning to the autopilot in an attempt to resolve a deteriorating situation. And instead of saving them, the autopilot kills them. And then this, the autopilot and the autopilot, however good, cannot recover the airplane from a critical flight attitude. So, as so many of you have seen coming to your manuals, all fleets, and each of these respective areas where they are treated, 
We're talking now about disconnecting the autopilot and the auto throttles in order to maintain control and extract maximum performance for each of these things. And we've talked about all these today, unusual attitude recoveries, microbursts, high altitude upset, GPWS mode 2 terrain warnings, engine failure, low altitude, low energy, flight instrument malfunctions, mid-air Well, we haven't talked about mid-air collision avoidance, but that's a perfect example of automation dependency. Let, let me tell you a story about me. This is me. I participated in this. I mean, you know how in training in a highly automated airplane, we start you out on day one typing, and on day 10, you're still typing when you finished? Well, I, last time I did a key, one of the last times I did a key about two and a half years ago in the 7576 program before Cecil started beating up on me here with this, the, uh, uh, I had a captain and a co-pilot. I picked them up on day six. Great guys. They were doing a super job. They already knew their stuff, and any time I suggested something to them, they did it that way the next time. It was great working with them. They did a super job on day six, seven, and eight. Day nine, we went into the rating ride. They both did great on the rating ride. Day 10, the loft period, I've got the captain for his loft. I'm going to have him fly from uh, Orange County, Santa Ana, up to San Jose, okay? It's going to be a perfectly clear day. I want him to do that noise abatement departure. And the one thing he doesn't know, though, is that I've got an MD-80 coming down the beach. You know how in the simulator, in the CAE simulator? <laughs> We can put that hard target out there, and I've got that guy coming down the beach at 5,000 feet. This captain doesn't know it, but, but he will hit this guy if he doesn't do something, okay? So he does the noise abatement departure, levels off at 5,000 feet. He's coasting out toward the beach. He hooks up his autopilot and auto throttles. That's great. He's got them hooked up. Now watch what this captain I train does when he sees that MD-80. He goes, oh, look at that. Yep, give me vertical speed up, vertical speed up right now, and give me flight level change. No, no, get the altitude window up. Now give me flight level. <laughs> I'm sitting on my jump seat going, I am so sorry. I did not mean to make you like this. <laughs> I mean, I really didn't. See, I didn't. Uh, it, I never would have thought a guy would have tried to use an autopilot to avoid a midair. But when you think about how we have, we have brought people up in highly automated airplanes, it's kind of understandable, isn't it? And, 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 I, and I contributed to that, obviously. And so I think everyone in this room knows what I'm driving at, clearly. Clearly. What should he have done when he saw that he was going to have a midair? Click, 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 right? Because a pilot with the controls and the throttles in his hand will do what it takes not to hit a plane he can see, I promise. <laughs> On the other hand, the autopilot is incapable of leaving altitude in any mode in less than 0.23 miles. It is in the algorithms. An autopilot does not understand the command, now. <laughs> This yellow stuff on the bottom, hold controls in position and disconnect, that came from Dale Rance. Dale Rance is the chief test pilot, Boeing 747 project. Dale said, Van, you know, I agree with you on all of these issues here that they need to be disconnecting their autopilots and auto throttles. But be sure and remind them of this. When they disconnect, hold the controls tightly. And there's good accident history on this. What Dale is saying is, the autopilot has probably started to do something in pitch and or roll that is essentially correct for what's going wrong. So when you disconnect, hold on tightly. Do not grab it with a wet noodle hand, disconnect, and have the yoke jump out of your hand. There's some real interesting history on that, like the 7-4 that lost number four and ends up rolling inverted out there when the yoke jumps out of his hand. Hold on, disconnect, make that your starting point, go from there. The red box on this slide is not in your operating manuals. This red box really is from Cecil to you. What we're trying to say here, and I think what Cecil's trying to say here, is that we have to go back. Back when I started 25 years ago with American Airlines, I was an engineer on the engineer seat for low seven or eight years, and every time I came back here to recurrent training, I sat in that engineer seat and I listened to those check airmen telling those pilots, fly the plane first, fly the plane first, and the pilots did. They flew the plane first. 
But then about 15 years ago, we started to become more and more automated in our cockpits. And as the level of automation increased more and more, we started talking about pushing buttons up here on AFES mantle or typing in typewriters down here, okay, to make the airplane's flight path adjust. Because we were being told by the industry that we were to become automation managers. But the accident history of the first six years of the 90s clearly shows automation managers plugging themselves into the ground all over this planet. We are not automation managers. We are captains and pilots. And by our aviator skills, we are to ensure the vertical and lateral pass of these planes at all times. We will use the wonderful tools of automation that have been provided to us to help us with that task. But when the automation is not maintaining the intended flight path, we will turn it off and maintain the path by our skills. As an example of approach parameters, if you're coming down a non-precision approach and the autopilot's engaged and you're in the last segment of this and you're in vertical speed and it becomes apparent that your airplane for some reason or another is going to go through MDA, is it time to push altitude hold? It's not, is it? It's time to go click, 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 boom, because you can stop it at MDA. The autopilot can't. Or how about this? Let me ask you guys out here, the 7576 community, the A300 guys at all, what's the most often asked question in our cockpits? What's it doing now? <laughs> right? And I'm going to suggest to you if that question gets asked in a low altitude environment, the pilot flying should really be going click, 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 click. This airplane is departing from its intended flight path for some reason. Don't allow it. Maintain the path. Stabilize it, trim it up, and then say, why did it do that? And if it turns out to be mode confusion, which most likely it was, if you want to bring your computer up and put your autopilot and connect it back to it, fine. But don't allow the deviation. And then bottom line on this, to maintain flying skills. It's probably the most important segment in this automation dependency issue. As every pilot in this room understands, you know, if we're coming in somewhere and we decide we're going to get some hand flying time or something, and so we turn off our autopilot but we don't turn off our auto throttles, are we flying? No. We're just guiding the airplane to the V bars. There's not even a requirement for a cross check here. To maintain piloting skills, we must both manipulate the controls and manage the energy of the airplane. In doing so, it requires a cross-check and the maintenance of normal piloting skills. You know, Cecil's a great leader. I'll say that with him in here. Either. He's a great leader. And <laughs> and, and Cecil would never say to you, you will. It ain't going to happen. He's a leader. But what Cecil is saying is, as often, as often as you can, pilots of American Airlines, when you deem the situation is right to practice your skills, turn off your autopilot and your auto throttles, fly your planes, maintain your skills, so the day something happens, you will have the proficiency and the complete confidence in your own ability to take over an airplane and fly it in any circumstance successfully. Listen to what I just said. I didn't change any procedure in American Airlines. None of them. If you take off with the auto throttles on, take off with the auto throttles on. What I said was, when you turn off the autopilot with the intention of hand flying to maintain skills, turn off the auto throttles too. Maintain your skills. We are, first and foremost, captains and pilots. But we must also be effective cockpit managers. 
On our automated flight decks, we must manage the various levels of automation available to us. Clearly, increasing levels of automation will reduce workload in most scenarios. However, we must change the culture that drives us to operate at the highest levels at all times. Automation lacks the ability to create flexible responses to unanticipated changes in flight path requirements. So, in these circumstances, a lower level of automation should lower workload and thereby preclude us from becoming task-saturated and losing our situation awareness.